I start this talk with an outline of what ciphertext fragmentation is. Then I'll go on to say how we formalize fragmentation. I'll describe some security notions that we introduce. And then I'll conclude with, some, with a comparison of our constructions. So I have to say that here I omit a lot of details about especially parts three and four. So I will mostly focus on the, fo on the motivation for this work and leave the details in the paper. So I'll just give you a small flavor of what we do. So what is ciphertext fragmentation about? So we have the usual setting where Alice and Bob uh, want to communicate securely over a secure channel. So Alice will use an encryption scheme. It will take some messages and encrypt them. And then she will send these, message, these ciphertexts over the channel. And the channel now will behave uh, in a different behavior that we normally assume. So it will deliver the ciphertext in a sequence of chunks, which we call ciphertext fragments. And now this imposes uh, some further requirements on Bob. It requires some extra functionality for Bob in order to be able to parse the ciphertext fragments correctly and uh, have correct decryption. So what we assume about the channel is that under normal operation, that is when the, there is no inter interference from the adversary, uh, the fragmentation pattern can be arbitrary, that is applied by the channel, but the order of the fragments is preserved. This is only for correctness. When we come to s define security notions, we relax the second notion. We don't care about the, the order of the fragments. So the adversary is able to change the pattern as he likes. So why is it important and why should we care about ciphertext fragmentation? So this setting emerges in practice, and we have encryption schemes where they have to operate over such channels. And one such example is that of secure network protocols like SSL and SSH. And the problem is that in cryptographic theory, the security models that we use don't normally capture this. And in recent years, ciphertext fragmentation has given rise to certain attacks which were able to break certain schemes which were proven secure before. So we have schemes that are proven to be secure, but when used over a fragmented channel, they are no longer secure. And this, of course, has left a gap between theory and practice. So here are two examples of ciphertext fragmentation attacks. So the first case was SSH, where a proof of security was first uh, given by Bellari, Cronin, and Prempre in 2004. And yet, in 2009, Albert Peterson and Watson presented a tech that was able to recover plain text from SSH. The second example was uh, in IPsec, when configured in Magdalene Encrypt using CBC mode encryption. So Magdan Encrypt with CBC mode encryption was first proven secure by Kraftcheck in 2001. A stronger result that built on this result was later given by Maurer and Tuckman in 2010. And yet, in the same year, there was an attack by Kenny and myself that uh, showed how ciphertext fragmentation can be used to break IPsec in such configurations. So to give you an idea of how ciphertext fragmentation can be abused, by an adversary in order to break a scheme. I'll give you them an idea of how SSH, the SSH attack works. So basically, this is how SSH encrypts a message. It's a bit complicated, but the main thing to notice here is that this packet length field here, this is what, how SSH uses uh, to handle ciphertext fragmentation. So encryption is done in an encrypt and MAC manner. So a MAC is computed over the encoded plain text then the plain text is encrypted, and the MAC is, is appended to the ciphertext. So then the encryption works as follows. As soon as SSH has received a complete block, the first ciphertext block, it will decrypt this block and inspect the packet length field. Then from this, it will know how much ciphertext it needs to wait for in order to be able to decrypt and verify the MAC. So SSH commonly uses CBC modes for encryption, and when this is done, then the following attack works. So the adversary can intercept a ciphertext and say he wants to recover partial plain text from this ciphertext block CI star. And because in CBC mode we can swap easily ciphertext around, he can take the ciphertext block and send it as the first block for decryption. So then, as I said before, in decryption, what SSH does, it decrypts this block and it will interpret the first uh, 32 bits of this plain text as the length field. So then what the adversary does is that it will start sending a sequence of random bytes of ciphertext, 
one by one until eventually it will observe a Mac failure error. Once this happens, it knows that the amount of ciphertext uh, bytes that it has sent corresponds to the value of this length field here. So in this way, the, the amount of ciphertext bytes it can send leaks the first 30 bits of the plain text block. So this is the idea, the main idea behind the SSH attack. So, uh, so the first work to, cater, to analyze uh, ciphertext fragmentation was the first done by Pedersen and Watson in 2010. The main result there was to show that if in SSH we replace CBC mode with a stateful counter mode, then the scheme becomes secure in the presence of ciphertext fragmentation. However, the security notion, their, their work basically is mostly focuses on SSH. And the notion is closely tied to SSH in that it assumes that the ciphertext is formatted in, for SSH. So their notion only applies for SSH. And also at first glance, uh, ciphertext fragmentation might show some resemblance to something which is another area, which is called online encryption. But we emphasize that the two are very distinct and is joined. So the contribution of our work is the following. We start by giving a syntax, a new syntax for an encryption scheme that works over ciphertext over fragmented channels. We also introduce security notions. We then provide uh, generic constructions of fragmented schemes that meet our security notions from normal atomic schemes. We then formalize other security goals that practical schemes normally try to achieve as well. And we call these boundary hiding and robustness against fragmentation-related denial of service attacks. And then finally, we present a, street, a scheme, a construction that achieves all three of our security notions. So in order to cater for fragmentation, we have to redefine the syntax of an encryption scheme. So we define a fragmented symmetric encryption scheme as a triple of algorithms. As usual, we have the key generation algorithm, which outputs a key, and an initial encryption state, sigma naught, and the initial decryption state, tough node. Then encryption works as usual with a slight difference. Now it takes a message and a state, an encryption state, and it outputs a ciphertext and an updated state. And the encryption algorithm can be probabilistic, stateful, or both. And if we want to model a stateless scheme, we just let the state be the empty string. Then for decryption, now the main difference is in decryption, actually, the decryption algorithm. So the decryption algorithm now, now takes a ciphertext fragment. It takes a decryption state. It will output a string M and the updated decryption state. And now the decryption state is required to be deterministic. And in order to cater for fragmentation, it inherently has to be stateful. And the output is actually a string now over the following alphabet, which is the union of the binary alphabet, um, the set of error symbols um, sigma perp, or s perp, and a special symbol here that we call the end of message symbol. This symbol will be used to indicate boundaries between messages. So now we also have to define uh, correctness. So we define correctness formally in the paper, but here I will explain to you pictorially. So we require that for any message vector, so any vector of messages, in this case, uh, three messages, if we encrypt these separately and then join the ciphertext, concatenate the ciphertext, and for any string that we can append at the end and then apply an arbitrary fragmentation pattern to give us a sequence of ciphertext fragments, if we send the ciphertext fragments to the decryption algorithm one by one and we get the outputs, the requirement is that the concatenation of these outputs, m1 prime to m5 prime, is prefixed with the encoding of the original message vector. And the encoding is this one here. So it's a concatenation of the message vector separated with the special end of message symbol. So that is correctness. So you see that already it's a bit more complex to define correctness. So there's more challenges in the security notions as well. So our starting point for defining security now um, was the notion in the CFCCA introduced by Balarikon and Prempre. This is basically an extension, a, a stronger variant of NCCA that additionally protects against replay attacks and uh, out-of-order delivery attacks. 
So we extend this notion to cater for ciphertext fragmentation, and we call this new notion in the Ceph CFA, where CFA stands for chosen fragment attack. And we then provide a generic construction for transforming the atomic scheme into a fragmented scheme. And this construction makes use of a prefix-free encoding. And if the atomic scheme that we start from is in the Ceph CCA, then the resulting construction, the resulting scheme is in the Ceph CFA. So basically, this construction shows that it's not so hard to achieve security uh, under chosen f to achieve security in the fragmented setting. But this is not the end of the story, because if we go back and look at SSH, we find that the design of SSH were actually trying to achieve more than just confidentiality. And we identify two further goals that uh, SSH tries to achieve. We call the first one boundary hiding, and the second one is robustness against fragmentation related denial of service attacks. And now things get more interesting because meeting such security goals without compromising confidentiality is more difficult. An example, uh, if one looks at the details of the SSH attack, one finds that, for example, the, the, the countermeasure that SSH introduces to get boundary hiding is what, lets, is what actually makes the SSH, the SSH attack possible. So, because SSH tries to achieve boundary hiding, that's how it loses confidentiality. And actually, the countermeasure that SSH takes to limit denial of service attacks makes the attack even more efficient. So you see here that there's a, an opposing conflict here going on, where all these three security notions are pulling in different directions. So the first goal was boundary hiding. So, in theoretical committee, normally we know that it is inevitable that the ciphertext will leak the message length. However, in practice, it's a real problem. So we normally don't try to meet this goal because we, think we know it's impossible, or we consider it impossible. But in practice, it's a real problem. And because the theoretical community hasn't provided any uh, sound, theoretically correct, theoretically sound way of protecting against this, what is normally done in practice is that People and practical schemes use heuristic techniques. And later, there has been some work which looked at these schemes in order to protect against traffic analysis. Of course, the problem here is that uh, leaking the length does give rise to traffic analysis attacks. That's why this is a problem in practice. And as we saw earlier, as a sage tries to encrypt the length field, this does not by itself conceal the message length, but it does uh, conceal cipher, ciphertext boundaries. So informally, we define boundary hiding uh, that given a concatenation of ciphertext, no adversary can determine whether the ciphertext boundaries lie. And now, immediately, we can notice a conflict because in the correctness requirement, intuitively, you can see that the decryption algorithm needs to be able to determine where the ciphertext boundaries are in order to decrypt correctly. And now we want to be able to hide the ciphertext boundaries from the adversaries. So the only way we can accommodate these two is to make the ciphertext boundaries evident only to someone who knows the secret key. So with this intuition in mind, we can then go back and extend our original construction uh, and replace the prefix-free encoding scheme with a key prefix-free encoding scheme, or a family of prefix-free encodings, if you want. And this gives us boundary hiding in the passive case. Then the notion can be extended to the active setting by giving the adversary access to a decryption oracle. But this is more challenging to achieve. This is more challenging to achieve. And the, no the construction, the only construction we have that achieves this is the intermec construction, which I will mention at the end. Then, if we on goes back and looks at uh, the SSH standard. One finds that um, one finds a paragraph where it's described that um, certain or the SSH standard warns against certain denial of service attacks. Basically, the idea is that an adversary can intercept a ciphertext, manipulate the length field, say by flipping the most significant bit of this length field, to change it into a huge value. So now, a ciphertext. So. That will be the first ciphertext, and when it's received by the decryption algorithm, it will interpret this as a fragment of a huge ciphertext. 
And then what happens is that every uh, subsequent ciphertext that is received will be interpreted as a fragment of this huge ciphertext. So we get a situation where ciphertexts are being fed into the decryption algorithm, and no message is coming out of the decryption algorithm. And the user experiences this as a connection hang. And the way SSH has, the only way SSH has to mitigate this attack is to limit the maximum message length. Now, such denial of services attacks are not specific to SSH, but arise in general when we consider ciphertext fragmentation in general. And the way we define uh, and denial of security against denial of service is the following. We say that a scheme is end of secure. If no adversary can produce an unbit long sequence of ciphertext fragments that was not previously output by the, by the encryption oracle, such that the encryption algorithm returns the empty string throughout. So now we can compare the constructions. So we have SSH CBC, which was uh, the original mode used by SSH. Then we have SSH CTR, which was proved secure by Patterson and Watson. PF is the prefix tree construction that we introduced first. KPF is the keyed variant of it, which also achieves boundary hiding in the passive case. And then we have Intermac. And you see that Intermac is able to achieve all of our four security notions. And in particular, you can know that Intermac can achieve end of security without limiting uh, the maximum message length to be n. So it can be achieve end of security for n smaller than the maximum size of the message. So I think I went very fast, actually, so I left a lot of details out. You can have a look at the paper for more details. So finally, to conclude, uh, in our work, we provide a general framework for analyzing security in the presence of ciphertext fragmentation. Then we describe practical constructions and use, using standard primitives, showing that security in the presence of ciphertext fragmentation can be achieved uh, using standard assumptions and both eff and efficiently. However, Intermax still incurs some overhead when compared to uh, state-of-the-art authenticated encryption schemes, so there is still room for improvement there. And a full version of our paper will be available soon on ePrint. Thank you very much.